Hi, fourth grade. Ooh, fourth grade. Sorry. Ms. Sanders' voice went out. All right. How are you guys doing? All righty. Here is what we did on Monday. So um, Monday we started with our um, book and our Go Noodle. Then we got into multiplication is our new unit in math. So we talked about arrays and factors. So um, all of this is in Seesaw. So when you go to your activities, go down to math. Let me open up mine. All right, so here we made some arrays. We took 12 and um, 12 of our circles and we made a different array. So an array is an arrangement of objects in rows and columns. So here is um, a four by three. I made one similar as well. And um, here is um, a different way that you can show this. So you can arrange the same number different ways and we can get the same area. An area is the number of uh, square units needed to cut, cover a flat surface. So here I can count all these and I can get 12. Um, same thing with these down here. I can also use this to help me with skip counting. 3, 6, 9, 12, um, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, or 6, 12, or 3, 6, I don't know, 4, 8, 12. I don't remember which way I started. But anyways, you can use these to help you skip count and um, to find your um, area for how much you use. Here are all the ways that you could have showed 12. So it says these are all the different arrays I can make with 12 circles. Each of these numbers are factors of 12. So a factor are the two numbers that you multiply together to get a product. So here, um, each of these, I'm, I can take these and I can multiply them together. And those are my factors. Again, factors are two numbers that when we multiply them together, we get the product. Product is the answer to our multiplication uh, problem. So here, all of these have an answer of 12. The factors are what we're multiplying together. So two times six gives me 12. Six times two gives me 12. Four times three, three times four, 12 times one, one times 12. All of those equal out to 12. So when we put them in order, we put them from least to greatest. And we don't need to repeat anything. We just need to list it one time. Um, our factors of 12 are 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, and 12. Here, 16. You can see that 1 times 16 is 16. 2 times 8 is 16. They had to skip over 3 because 3 times something doesn't, it doesn't ever give you 16. So 4 times 4 is 16. So then the factors of 16 are 1, 2, 4, 8, and 16. Same thing down here with 24, same thing with 36. Um, you can go start with, always start with one, and then just go through. Here, I know nothing times five is um, gonna equal 24. Then once you get back to a number that you've already wrote, uh, that you've already written down, um, you don't need to write it down twice, so you don't need to put like six and four. Then you can go to seven, we already did eight, nothing for 9, 10, so you can go through the list till you get to your number and write down all those things that you can multiply together to give you that product. All right, so here, um, let me make this bigger. On this page here, we did the highlighted problem, so let me zoom in. Um, this space right here was just if you wanted to keep making um, the arrays to find them, but everybody was doing pretty good with the multiplication chart. So again, here's a review of what we did. Um, we went and found the factors for 15, 25, and 18. And students need to, needed to finish the remaining for 21, 16, and 20. And then um, the way, again, that we're doing that is we're just making, um, like for 15, just make a little, make a little, ay, 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 move. Move. There we go. All right, make a little um, T-chart and put uh, 15 at the top. Make your T and then always start with 1. 1 times 15 is 15. 2, nothing by 2. Uh, 3, 3 times 5 is 15. Nothing for 4. Um, I already have 5 on there, so that's it. So 3, 1, 5, and 15. Um, those are all my factors, so I'm going to put them in order from least to greatest, one, 
3, 5, 15. Yep. All right. That was where we stopped. Oh, oh, I forgot to show one thing. Pull back up real quick. The very last page that we did was here. So there's a video to watch. Um, it's on factors. And then in your own words, how can you find the factors of a given number? So um, if I give you a number, let's say uh, six, how would you go and you find the factors of that um, given number? So um, you can either type your response in the box or you can record. Either one's fine, but make sure you're working um, one to four on Seesaw. All right, so that was math, page one through four. And then for reading today, we read um, A Long Winter's Nap, and we we're talking about cause and effect. And so here, this is in Seesaw as well. So it says many animals hibernate because the weather gets colder and food gets much harder to find in the winter. The word hibernate means deep sleep. Animals like groundhogs crawl deep into their burrows and go to sleep. Their bodies stay alive by using extra fat stored up before winter. True hibernation is more like death than just plain sleeping. All life activities stop. The body temperature lowers, breathing slows down, hearts barely stay uh, beating, and an animal burns up stored food very, very slowly. If the temperature gets too low, the hibernating animal might wake up, dig a deeper hole, and go right back to sleep. Some cold-blooded animals also hibernate. Earthworms crawl deep into the dirt. Frogs bury themselves in pond mud. And snakes crawl into holes in the ground. Insects hide under rocks or logs. And other animals sleep more and for longer periods of time. This includes bears, squirrels, and chipmunks. This is not true hibernation. They are able to wake up and go outside on warmer winter days. All hibernating animals wake up in the spring as it gets warmer outside or warm outside. They are very hungry and must start searching for food to eat. So here on this, um, the things that we did, we talked about summary. Um, this is just the same story again, so you can see it. Uh, we answered these four questions. So how are animals able to hibernate? Um, according to the information in the text, which of these cold-blooded animals hibernate? Which causes hibernating animals to wake up in the spring? And then which of the following is an effect of winter hibernation? And then on this last page, again, this is just the story again, uh, we wrote different causes and effects. So cause, um, something happens. So let's say my shoe's untied, the effect, um, is going to be what happens after that. So if my shoe's untied, I may fall down. Or if my shoe's untied, I may have to bend down and, and tie it. So um, cause is going to lead to your effect. Um, it could also be worded differently. Um, you could say uh, Miss Snyder fell down because her shoe was untied. So it could be swapped, um, but still the same thing. Something happened and then something happened as a result of it. So we worked on... Um, those two pages and um, we actually we didn't get to this page we'll start we'll do this one tomorrow um, so what was that one through one through three and then students worked on we finished this first story do, 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 do. All right, small group only. I'm gonna change this to say, cause we've been working on this. Fourteen, in week fourteen now. So for that assignment, um, you are. We read it. Um, I told students to. So we read the George Smile Maker. Um, so for their independent work, um, they finished uh, training a therapy dog, and then um, they started answering questions 
Um, so this is going to be due by uh, Friday. So make sure those questions are um, getting answered. You can do a little bit each day and then do by Friday. And then um, for writing today, make sure that was it on the agenda. I'm going to... We did, I'm going to change this because we only went one, two, three, and then I'm going to change this to page four. All right, so um, in writing, we did some grammar practice, and then um, we got into an assignment on the body part of our paper. All right, so if you open this up... All right, so here we went to tilted towers and practice homophones, irregular verbs, irregular nouns, spelling patterns, and verb tense. And so this section right here, we did some practice questions. So what change, if any, should be made to sentence 15? The whole family make a cake for Julia's birthday party. The first one says change four to four. So this is a spelling change. Notice they're using um, four and four, the homophone. Um, it's the same word, but it's spelled differently. So when you spell it F-O-U-R, you're talking about the number. So if you replace it for Julia's birth, that, that doesn't make sense that we would use the, the number four. So we took that one out. Um, change make to made. So instead of right here, we're going to put made. The whole family made a cake. That makes sense. So we, we, um, we're hanging on to that one. This one changed Julia's with the apostrophe S to Julia's with no S. So here, when you have an apostrophe S, the word that follows is showing ownership. So Julia's birthday, meaning the birthday belongs to Julia. If you just have the S, then that means you've got multiple Julia's, which didn't make sense. It's Julia's birthday party. The birthday party belongs to her, so we need that apostrophe S. And then change whole to whole. So here, the whole family, meaning like everybody, the whole, everybody, the whole family, mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, aunts, uncles, all of them, versus whole, H-O-L-E, is like, I have a hole in my shirt or there's a hole in the ground. So that didn't make sense. So we want to be on that one. Number two says, what change, if any, should be made to sentence 15? Most students in Texas look forward when they're practicing for STAR, but not this class. All right, the first one, change Texas to Texas. Oh, excuse me. So that didn't make sense because we are not lowercase, um, making Texas lowercase because Texas is a proper noun. The next one, change board to board. So B-O-A-R-D is like board, um, like a board that you would build with a house, like build a house. B-O-R-E-D is like, oh, this is so boring. Like, oh, like board like that. So we like that one. So we kept that. C says change there to there. So whenever you have this apostrophe, it stands for they are. So in order to check if that's correct, you just plug it in. So break those words apart. They are. So it says most students in Texas look bored when they are practicing. Um, that fits. So we don't need the E-I-R. We need that apostrophe. And then number three, what change, if any, should be made in sentence 15? Soldiers travel on foot through the city looking for their enemies. Here, change soldiers to soldiers. They just changed the spelling. So we said that the first spelling was correct, so we don't need to change that. Through to through. Again, here's another homophone, but they've it's got a different meaning and a different spelling. So through is talking about like you go through something. T-H-R-E-W through is talking about like you threw something away in the trash can. So we said the first one was correct because they're traveling, um, traveling through the city. They're going through it. Um, next one, enemy to enemies or enemies to enemies. So here, if we look over here at, I think they said his name is Fishstick. I don't know, maybe. Um, it's some reminders about how we make a noun plural. So when you have that Y and there's a consonant before it, you drop the Y and add I-E-S. But words like boy, where you have that O in front of the Y, then you just add an S or like toy just gets an S. So there's rules that you need to follow if you're adding um, an S at the end of these words. So we said that enemies, the correct way that you would spell that is E-N-E-M-I-E-S. 
So enemies, you drop the Y, add the IES. This one says add a comma after travel. This one didn't make sense. Um, if you read it with the pause, soldiers travel, pause, on foot through the city. You don't, you don't need it. Soldiers travel on foot through the city. You don't need to pause there. So we took that one out. All right. Then we got into talking, uh, we did a little bit of a review about the different parts of our paper. So expository essays, when writing an expository composition, um, this is the type of writing we're doing, it must explain and give facts, reasons, examples, and details about the main idea or prompt. The, uh, every good expository essay contains an introduction, the body, and the conclusion. Okay, so the body, um, the body is where we're gonna be working at this week. Um, but we wanted to just review here. So here's the whole paper. You can think of it like a hamburger. So the first part, you start off like we did last week with your introduction. You give your hook, your central idea. Sometimes like here when it says main idea, main idea, central idea, same thing. We're talking about um, like what the whole paper is going to be about. Body, here this one has three reasons with supporting details. You, um, the paper's fine if you have two. Um, you need at least two to three reasons supporting whatever you said. So if your paper is about um, your favorite food and they want you to explain why, your, uh, excuse me, your central idea is you telling the reader what your favorite food is. So my favorite food is hamburgers. Then you're going to give three reasons why. So my, my first reason I like hamburgers is because blank and then you're gonna support it with details. You're not just gonna stop there, you have to give those details that extend and expand on that um, reason. Then the bun at the end, your conclusion. So this meat, cheese, lettuce, tomatoes, this all, this middle part of this hamburger, um, I keep telling the kids, you know, when you go to order a hamburger, nobody says, I'll, I'll take a hamburger, but no meat, cheese, lettuce, or tomatoes, just, just bring me the bread. Nobody says that, you'd be crazy, right? Um, nobody just asked for the bread of a hamburger. So this middle part, this is where all the good stuff is. So this body that we're going to be practicing is very, very important. We want to really have a good, um, strong reasons of why we're saying what we're saying. All right, here's just a review of the funnel. Um, again, introductions, they have to include that hook. You want to hook your reader from the get-go. Tell them what your central idea is and then get into the body. So the body gives the idea, um, gives ideas about the main idea that are supported. They're supported by giving facts, reasons, examples, and details. So if you say, um, I like hamburgers because they're juicy, get, then you're gonna take it a step further and give some example, give an example, um, give a reason why, something like that that supports it. It is very important to write the supporting details in order. The body should not include details that do not support the main idea or topic. So if I'm writing about a paper and it's asking me my favorite food and to explain why, I'm not going to start, uh, I'm not going to talk about hamburgers being my favorite food and then all of a sudden switch and start talking about pizza because um, that that's confusing. Okay, so stay on a clear path and um, make sure that you're not kind of veering off to another topic. All right, expanding details. The supporting details in the body of an expository essay should have a sentence or two that follows each detail. These sentences give facts, reasons, examples, and details that help expand your ideas and make them more interesting. This helps your essay become more than just a list of ideas, and it makes, the, it, makes it more appealing to the reader. So when you give, um, when you expand your details, um, like when I said, you know, I like hamburgers because they're juicy, um, it would sound very boring if I immediately said, um, I like hamburgers because, I like hamburgers because they're juicy. I like hamburgers because they're tasty. I like hamburgers because they are, um, there's lots of different options. That would sound that would sound boring, and nobody's gonna. I call it a shopping list. You're just giving this list of reasons why you like um, whatever it, whatever it's talking about. So we want to expand and really um, really grow those ideas. Uh, one way that we go from idea to idea is using transition words. So 
transition words help you. Um, so for example, first, next, then, finally, lastly, also in addition, furthermore. Moreover, for example, in conclusion, these transition words, they help um, make your essay very organized. They give the reader, okay, um, like when you say um, next, your reader knows, okay, we're, we're not talking about that one idea anymore. Now we're going on to the next idea. Okay, so they help you kind of move your reader along through your paper. All right, so independent work, students in their own words described um, what should be included in these parts of the paper. So what needs to be in an introduction? What needs to be in a body? And then um, we looked at this page here at, and da, 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 write about a special person, explain what makes this person special to you. So here's a paper about um, my mom that I wrote. And we went and we identified the different parts. So we underlined in pink the introduction. We underlined in blue the transition words. Underlined in red the topic sentence. Circled the body. And in the purple, uh, we underlined in purple those supporting details. And then that was it for that. All right, then, and we, we went, we were kind of rocking and rolling, so we jumped into some of Tuesday, so that was fine. We went a little further with writing. All right, renewable and non-renewable resources. So for science today, we were, we were in seesaw for everything almost. All right, so science, renewable, and non-renewable resources. All right, so here's what we talked about today. So it says, what is, oh, excuse me. It says, what are natural resources? So the materials that we use from nature, such as wind energy, water, plants, and animals, and fossil fuels, to make the things we need are called natural resources. They are the basis of life on Earth. So think of natural resources as like the big umbrella. Then you can take all of those things the wind energy, the water, the plants, the animals, those fossil fuels, the coal, oil, natural gas, all of those things, minerals, all of it, all of them separate them into two categories. So the two categories, one of them is renewable resources and the second is non-renewable resources. <clears throat> and again, they are the same word except for this one has that non in front of it, meaning not. Ooh, I cannot write with my mouse. Hold on. Non means not. So they are not renewable. All right. So what does renewable mean? Let me move me out of the way. All right. Renewable resources are those that can be replaced or never run out. Examples include solar energy. So from our sun, uh, wind, in, uh, wind power, geo, geothermal energy, hydroelectric energy, which is water, talking about water, and biomass, which is the materials made from plants and animals. So solar energy, so since Earth formed, the sun has produced energy in the form of light and heat. So since it's not going anywhere anytime soon, and we have an abundance of this light and heat, we put it under the uh, category of renewable. Wind power, same thing. The sun is heating our earth. It is causing wind and moving air. So as long as that sun is shining, um, the wind remains an infinite renewable resource. On page two, this little thing is in the way. All right, flowing water. Let me see if I can just take it out. There we go. All right, flowing water creates energy that can be captured and turned to electricity, which is called hydroelectric power. Hydro means water. So when you see this word hydro, uh, you know we're talking about water. So it says water is constantly renewed by the water cycle, which makes this a renewable resource. When we use heat from the earth to generate energy, it's called geothermal energy. Geo means earth. So this geo part right here, this prefix geo means earth and thermal means heat. The earth is constantly being warmed up by its core. So when we use geothermal energy, we don't use up resources like we do when we burn gas. So when we burn coal, what we're burning, um, it's not gonna continue 
um, like geothermal, where it's just, it's constantly being heated, um, coal is not a constant thing. It takes millions and millions of years to uh, produce. So geothermal is nice because it's a heat that is continuous. So geothermal heat, here it shows the pumps, um, cooling and heating a house. And um, the thing that is uh, heating it like that is from the core of the earth, the, the heat that's from underground. So here we've uh, filled in questions one through six. What are natural resources? What are two different types of natural resources? True or false? Renewable resources cannot be replaced. We listed three examples of renewable resources. We talked about what uh, hydroelectric power is and then uh, what it's called when we use heat from the earth to generate energy. Then for independent work, students watched um, this video talking about natural resources and then we hit draft. Then for social studies today, um, that's found in Google Classroom. So they went to their um, Monday through Friday social studies for week 14. And then on the agenda, they had a, a video here that they watched. In intervention um, and enrichment time, we went over our multiplication facts and we, um, students had time to um, go make some corrections. They had um, over 30 minutes to go work on assignments that are needing to be corrected. So hopefully those, some of those got turned in and I'll get those corrected um, or graded and, and that grade fixed. And then that was it. They went to STEAM today and that was everything. All right. Thank you, guys.